And welcome, fellow unemployables, to this week's edition of Seven Figure Small, the show that provides creative freelancers and entrepreneurs like you with compelling stories and actionable strategies for living the seven figure small lifestyle. This is our 180th episode overall, and it is the third episode of Seven Figure Small Live, in which we broadcast our recording with a live audience of Unemployable Initiative members. I'm your host, Jared Morris, partner and community leader here at Unemployable. And to begin the proceedings here today, let me introduce to my left... He is my partner at Unemployable and my seven-figure small co-host. He is a serial digital entrepreneur who has started several seven-figure businesses plus one eight-figure business that was acquired in 2019. He's a writer, a traveler, a curator, and a former Texan who I recently saw is not above throwing some Twitter shade at the state that he once called home. Seems like a train wreck over there. He is Brian Clark. Brian, what's on your mind this week? (laughs) Oh, you know, Texas. I spent 40 years there. I can throw some shade at it, can I? I mean, I've earned that. And but, so has uh, Texas. So has Texas. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to bring that part up. I thought that was evident. Um, yeah, it's interesting. The uh, traveler aspect that you mentioned in my bio, you know, it's March of 2021. It's been a full year of the pandemic, which means it's been a full year since I've been on an airplane. Uh, full year since I've seen the ocean, not crying too hard. The Rockies are, are pretty spectacular, especially compared to North Texas. Right, Jerry. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, that's just me, uh, not feeling sorry for myself necessarily. Cause obviously very blessed, but, uh, never take anything for granted. You know, I mean, Taking travel away from me, even though I've taken many road trips in the last year to keep my sanity, uh, has really just defined how important that is to me and how, you know, the, the entrepreneurial lifestyle that I lead is really kind of designed to fuel that, you know, um, the perks, I guess, the experience of, of life. On the other hand, uh, this week, my, uh, Two 75-year-old plus parents got their first vaccine shots in Houston, and that has been much more stressful over the last year than not being able to travel, worrying about them, even though we're, they were super careful, uh, you know, did everything they were supposed to, and thankfully did not get sick or have anything unfortunate happen, and they did get their first uh, vaccine shot. So, you know, I think we're coming out of it. It's been... An, you know, on one hand, a long year. And on the other hand, it seems like it was just yesterday that we were here in March of 2020 trying to figure out what was going on with this thing and how it was going to affect those of us in our community, those of us out there listening to the show. Um, So I I feel like we're getting there, you know, but perhaps the biggest thing on my mind is, am I going to make it to till 2 a.m. to watch the WandaVision finale tonight, or am I going to fall asleep and watch it first thing in the morning? That's the important question, really. Mm. I have a newborn at home, so I will definitely be up at 2 o'clock this morning. So <laughs> that, that I can promise you. <laughs> different reasons. Different yes, reasons. yes, different reasons. Okay, and joining us today... He describes himself as a serial entrepreneur since childhood who has built many businesses and retired at age 35 from his position as a hedge fund investment manager responsible for a $20 million plus dollar portfolio. He then went on to found a financial mentor where he doesn't just teach people important principles for money management, but he also helps people see how the pursuit of financial freedom provides a transformational path to personal fulfillment. He is Todd Tresseter. Todd, welcome to Seven Figure Small Live. What is the most unemployable thing about you to start up? Um, just my beingness. I've been unemployable my whole life. I can't, I can't even imagine somebody owning my creativity, me having to answer to somebody, uh, somebody else deciding what I do and don't do. Um, I just can't even imagine it. It's just never been that way. I worked for one company for six months and I got fired. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm completely unemployable. I've always been that way. And you've done pretty well on your own. So I think it, I think it works. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, you get your share of blunders, but that's part of the adventure of living it. You know, if you want to yeah. embrace the adventure, you're going to do some really smart stuff and some really stupid stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, here is what we have on tap for you guys this week in this week's edition of Seven Figure Small Live. We will start out with headlines, discuss some of the hottest topics that are out there affecting freelancers and entrepreneurs, and then we will dive into our main topic, a discussion with Todd about his path from successful practitioner to successful mentor. And finally, we will end with some Q&A with live audience participation, not only welcomed, but encouraged if you want to hop on here with us. Okay, but let's start with some headlines. And our first headline today is about non-fungible tokens, commonly referred to as NFTs. You've probably heard this term a lot over the last couple of months. If it is your first time hearing it, here's a basic definition. An NFT is a special type of cryptographic token that uses blockchain technology to represent something unique. In other words, NFTs are not mutually interchangeable. And this is in contrast to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and many uh, network or utility tokens that are fungible in nature. And... You know, if you if you've been following this, we're seeing NFTs make headlines in digital collectibles like sports card trading, where, for example, NBA Top Shots has already grossed two hundred and thirty million dollars in sales, and in crypto art, where an artist known as Beeple sold an NFT for six point six million dollars. One, it's also making waves in music, where Kings of Leon will soon release the first NFT album. Brian, what are your early impressions of NFTs and how do you think they might affect writers and creators of even digital education products down the line? It's fascinating. And, and, uh, you know, these have kind of been, uh, there's been buzz around NFTs for in at least my awareness over the, you know, the last year, but I feel like over the last couple of weeks, while, you know, while you endured the, the winter wonderland in Texas and then went off and had a child, Mm. everyone and their dog was talking about NFTs, like just, you know, every newsletter, every forward looking kind of entrepreneurial, especially around the whole concept of the company of one or seven figure small. Um, I saw one uh, pundit who was not only talking about, you know, a one person company making seven or eight figures, but billions and trillions. Now this will be in the future with AI assistance and blockchain, you know, basically surrounding an individual. Is it far fetched? I don't think so. Are we there yet? No, but it certainly validates the premise of this show. You know, basically even surround- without all of us who've done it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, this, this idea that I'm, I'm kind of in just fascinated with of, of one or a few people just augmenting themselves with these amazing uh, technologies. But um, the NFT uh, use case has been kind of weird to say the least. A lot of of what's going on in the art and collectible space, I think is the Bitcoin rich kind of flexing a little, you know, they have basically all this wealth from Bitcoin going through the roof Uh, And they're buying stuff with it. Um, And I think it's important because it's establishing uh, an arena that will mature um, the Kings of Leon album thing. You know, I I thought they were going to do it to where one person got to bid on bragging rights to owning, you know, the NFT for that new album. But it's more just like a premium edition, which is not Mm. new necessarily. Um, had a discussion on Twitter about for writers, I, I just don't see, unless it's just a really phenomenal essay, uh, too many people, and, and there have been essays that are backed by NFTs. I think Bobby Hundreds has done it. Um, but that's kind of a special case. I mean, it's going to have to be something special to me, I think, uh, for someone to want to own that NFT. Like, for example, if you've got Seth Godin and he writes another book and you're betting that it's going to be a bestseller and, and whatnot. And he offers the NFT to one person for that book. Ostensibly it could go up in value on the secondary market because of the success it has through the normal distribution channels. Um, but to me, the most interesting thing that we're on the edge of uh, there's uh, people who are using crypto to buy virtual real estate in in virtual communities, you know, ours is a virtual community, but these are like second life virtual communities Hmm. and people are staking claims to 
prime locations within that space, right? Um, again, it it may be people who have more crypto money than they know what to do with, but I do think it it, it sets a precedent. I mean, think about think about you just bought a house, Jared. Okay, mm-hmm. there's a an archaic system of deeds and mortgages that are get filed per county, right? And then you got to pay for title insurance to make sure that your land is valid, which is a total scam. I mean, at at this point, we generally know if there's any sort of dispute or cloud over any sort of title. So imagine that system being replaced by blockchain, the need for title insurance goes away because the the blockchain, the NFT for that property is recorded on the ledger. It can't be duplicated, it can't be invalidated. Now think of virtual real estate and where we'll be in about 10 years. Um, it's fascinating stuff. I just feel like it's it's earlier than all the hype deserves. And Todd, as a financial professional, I'd love to hear what he has to say about mm-hmm. it. Well, I, I thought your take was interesting, Brian, in the sense that this is probably endemic of the fact that we're in late stages of a bull market and there's a big speculative, there's a lot of speculation going on. And so there's people with plenty of money that are willing to throw it at NFTs when the model really isn't proven. And it's even in like how you were talking about it, there's a lot of complexity with it. For example, when you're talking about mortgages, um, that could be done without an NFT. That can just be a centralized blockchain that runs the mortgage market for a given county or whatever, where it's done and recorded and everything's done more efficiently. So for me, this is a very narrow niche and it's being explored with art. It's being, I mean, I can see why Jared was interested in it with the sports cards and sports memorabilia and all that. I can see where it got your attention, but for me, like it's, it's one of the most, I guess, infancy, that's not the right word of anything in the crypto space, anything in the digital finance space. The thing that's really compelling for me, given where I'm coming from is DeFi, you know, and digital finance in general, you know, you, you go into any town and you look, the best corners in town are held by banks. Those banks are relics. They're going to go away a gas station, just like electric cars are going to take gas stations out. You know, those things just, uh, there's not going to be a need. My daughter doesn't go to a bank. My daughter does everything on her smartphone. And that's only going to become more so as we go from just digital currency into central bank digital currencies. And the whole thing progresses. DeFi is going to move, pretty much eliminate middlemen. You know, I mean, those uh, those banks are going to be like a blockbuster chain or like Tower Records. I mean, they're just there's not going to be any function for them. Mm-hmm. And so that to me is the revolution that we're really looking at. And this uh, NFT thing is just so new. And there's so much complexity with how to get it right that I would prefer to stand aside and watch it evolve a bit first. Yeah, the de- decentralized finance or DeFi, I got to think it's got the venture capitalist nervous, right? If you get on the fly ability to fund these small, nimble little companies amongst each other without intermediaries, you know, and not necessarily giving up equity, there's so much happening. It's kind of hard to get your head wrapped around it. But Todd, you're right. Change is coming. Relics are going away. It's just a matter of how long is it going to take for this evolution to take place. So a lot of chatter worth paying attention to, but I I think it's a a watch and wait and see kind of thing at this point. Um, And of course, we'll be here talking about it as things progress. Yeah. To me, to me, the real issue is government regulation and central bank digital currencies. That's the real linchpin in this thing. I think if it was just up to market demand, we could already know where this was all going to go. But the real issue is, you know, government's not going to give up control of its sovereign. There's no historical precedent for government to do that. And so the Bitcoin maximalists running around saying that it's going to, you know, it's going to take over as a world currency. I don't know. There's no precedent for that. So it's a, it's a long shot bet. So to me, that's the big linchpin I'm watching for is where government comes in on the regulatory side. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. All right. Let's move on now to our second headline, which is about a topic that we love to discuss here at Unemployable, the future of work. So McKinsey recently released a report on the future of work after COVID. And as you might expect, a lot has changed. And many of those changes won't revert back once the pandemic is under control. Among the conclusions, e-commerce has grown and will continue to grow. Remote work and virtual meetings are likely to continue, albeit probably less intensely than at the pandemic's peak. And COVID-19 may propel faster adoption of automation and AI, especially in work arenas with high physical proximity. 
Todd, I'll start with you on this. How are you thinking about the changes that we've already seen and may see moving forward as a result of the pandemic? I was more interested in seeing Brian's opinion than my own. <laughs> um, I, you know, the thing that struck me about that that piece was how poorly it was put together in terms of just a user experience. I mean, for all of us on here that have online businesses, I looked at how they laid that thing out and I was shocked. I mean, I had really worked my way through it. There was no clear prioritization based on size, on how it was organized. I mean, I would have much preferred if they'd just done a single white paper and allowed me to print out a PDF and figure out what they were saying and scan it than to go through the way they had that thing organized. So for me, that was the one interesting piece was I thought it was incredibly laborious to even read or work with. And then because of how they did it, they tried to make it look cool rather than just make it functional. And then, uh, and then the other piece was the act of learning. I think the act of learning is a really important point for all of us to take. So anyway, I'm more interested in hearing what Brian has to say. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I actually did my first clubhouse thingy, um, which I was kind of underwhelmed by. It's interesting, I guess. I don't know how people have all day to spend on their talking. I mean, that's that's yeah. the biggest mystery to me. But on this topic, everything was remote work, remote work. And yes, it's a big deal. Um, maybe I'm underwhelmed because most of us who – are, are listening and, and doing this stuff have been remote for a long time, right? That's how we work. It, it's just how it is. And, and there are certainly are big impacts on commercial real estate. I mean, that's a big one. It, it's probably never going to come back, but that's something I've been thinking about for 10 years. Like eventually commercial real estate's going to take a hit. What would be the catalyst? Well, it was a pandemic, but everything that happened last year was an acceleration. It wasn't novel. It wasn't not going to happen. And the big thing for me still remains uh, the accelerated adoption of AI and automation and then soon robotics. Um, you know, we know we're going to lose a lot of jobs. Uh, every other time in history, technology has displaced workers. We've created new jobs. I'm still not convinced, though. I mean, we literally have software that learns. We have machines that can do physical labor. I mean, are we sure <laughs> these jobs are are going to you know come back? And what what are the quality of these jobs where it's going to be that very AI monitoring your productivity and telling you the optimal workflow that you should be following? Um, there was a there's an entrepreneur creating a calendar. She's actually in Denver and she was on this clubhouse thing. And the AI basically tells you the best order for you to do things in as an entrepreneur. Now, if it's my choice, great. Now imagine that in corporate America though. And that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. So number one, we're going to lose a lot of jobs. Number two, it remains to be seen how many new jobs are created. And three, what is the quality of those jobs. So my purpose in life is to get so many people out of that because we're allowed to replace ourselves with technology. If Todd finds a way to use AI to basically eliminate himself, it's still his business. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's an entirely different thing than being replaced uh, in a corporate role, you know? So I, I just think we're in for a world of hurt and disruption and that, you know, we're doing the Lord's work here, trying to get people to, to go out on their own before they're forced out, because it's always better to be proactive and start thinking ahead of time uh, before it, it, it's not your choice. So maybe yeah, I'm a I pessimist, think... but I'm also an optimist for human, creative human beings to use technology instead of being used by it. I think the key word you threw in there, Brian, was disruption. Um, we, can, we can be sure we're going to have massive disruption. Whether it's job loss or not, I don't think so. I think it just changes jobs. It transforms jobs, transforms the roles you play, um, makes you more efficient. Um, I think Mark Andreessen, there's a kind of a theme going through these two conversations so far. And it's a Mark Andreessen quote. I'm going to butcher it. You guys probably know it. It's something like software will eat the world. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're seeing with whether it's NFTs or with this disruption in the workplace or AI or any of this is you're seeing an acceleration of the role of software, because what's happening is we're having this convergence of all these technologies and they're starting to layer and overlap and connect. 
and the whole process is just accelerating. And so if you think it's fast now, it's just going to get faster and faster and faster. And I think that goes back to that point I was making uh, in the um, that piece, the McKinsey piece was about the importance of active learning and playing the role of an active learner to stay out in front of this curve. And that's particularly important for somebody like me. I'm sitting here with gray hair. I'm not native digital, you know, and for me to stay out in front of this, I mean, this is part of what keeps me young. Yeah. Yeah. The key word there is convergence. It's not just AI. It's not just blockchain. It's not just 3D printing. It's all of it coming together and and making for things we haven't really imagined happening before. And that that's what we got to look out for. I think it is not going to be boring. <laughs> so <laughs> no, yeah, definitely not. Okay. Um, and our last headline here comes from noted email revolutionary Cal Newport, who wants you to stop giving your clients your personal email address. So Cal writes an article at entrepreneur.com by eliminating the connection between email and people, you will with one grand gesture destabilize everyone's expectations about how communication should unfold, making it much easier for you to rebuild these expectations from scratch with a protocol that makes more sense. You can make your email inbox more manageable and shift how and when people communicate with you. And of course, we will put the links to all of these articles in uh, in the show notes. Brian, you are known for your long, expansive email replies. What do you think about Cal's idea here? <laughs> That's very funny. Um, <laughs> I will say that I'm a fan of Cal Newport's. Uh, his new book is like, what is it? The Death of Email or The End yeah. of Email or something. And uh, I found out about... Uh, Cal's new book because he sent me an email about it uh, because I'm on his <laughs> list, right? So I'm not sure he's thinking this all the way through. Um, uh, and, and that's, you know, just an obvious little uh, slap there. But, uh, you know, and he he did something with Jason Freed, who just started a new email service. So I, I think the gist here is a reinvention of email. It's not going anywhere. It's too baked in. Um but it was interesting to me on this particular headline, and I, I chose it for this reason, because I used to avoid letting people have my personal email address. And now I use my personal email address every time I communicate with our audiences, and I, I wouldn't change it. Maybe someday I'll have to, but this is how I'm figuring out, you know, we used to have, uh, you know, just copious blog comments and and social media used to be a little bit easier to manage. But now I rely on people hitting reply and telling me what they think, because that's the only way I'm getting meaningful feedback in what direction to go with product development, you know, future content, the problems and desires that need solving. It's invaluable. So I've kind of gone the other direction. Uh, I understand the point that's being made, but I think there can be a problem when you cut yourself off from the very people you're trying to help. Yeah. You know, I, I like being intentional with email and Todd, I really like how you have it set up, you know, cause I emailed you yesterday about the show and, and you know, and send you some notes for it. And I got an auto reply that basically had a few instructions for, you know, if this is urgent, do this, if it's not, you know, this is how I handle it, which seemed like it, it probably helps you manage it a lot. And it gave me really clear expectations for what to expect. Yeah. And I may even change that because um, what I may do is have my assistant send that reply as a canned reply that she just copies paste based on what the email is. So she doesn't even have to think about the reply because you figure, you know, an assistant at $25 an hour at, you know, two, 300 emails a day, it doesn't cost that much to at least make sure that that auto reply makes sense. And that way my paying customers aren't getting it, which sometimes offends them. Um, so hmm. the way I've done it, I think the way I want to characterize this is it really depends on your goals, you know? So like Brian's talking about how his goals have changed with time. So like for me, the way I do it is my, my paying clients and my course students all have my direct personal email address. And then I have a public facing email address, which my assistant manages right now. It's got that auto reply you're referring to. And I'm thinking what I need to do is just have her send the auto reply to the millions of guest post requests and millions of uh, affiliate solicitations <laughs> and all the other garbage I don't even want to look at, she can send that canned reply and we just deal with it, right? And then for more relevant stuff, they're not getting that auto reply. Uh, and I think that's actually going to be the sweet spot. 
Um, but I did take something of value out of what Cal did. Like I thought his interesting at Cal Newport reply address yeah. was, I, it caught my eye because what it does is he's correct. It resets expectations. Um, people have an expectation with email and by having that interesting at Cal Newport, they don't have an expectation of an immediate reply from him or any reply at all. I thought, no, that's interesting. That, that's something I got to think about. Um, but I, I do want to point out there's a personalization of business that gets lost. Um, you know, like with Brian as an example, if I send him an email, I get a reply from Brian, right? If he sends it to my personal address, he gets my reply. If you get too far, I've worked with people where they get too far from that. And pretty soon I don't deal with them. Um, there's, there's something lost. There's, there's, it's a real person. It's a real communication. And that's why I started with saying, what's your real goal here? You know, like for me, I'm trying to build a community. I'm trying to build connection. I'm trying to serve people. And so I don't want to necessarily just distance myself outright, but yet I have a problem. I got too much email. I have to manage it efficiently. And so I think there's a sweet spot somewhere in between that I don't think that that thing communicated. I think there's a lot of nuance to it. Mm. Yeah. Anything else to add on that, Brian? Yeah, just to follow up, I, I was reminded of a situation where a noted personal brand um, marketer who, you know, I've known for a long time and did favors for and all that. Um, I wrote them a personal email. They had someone respond to tell me that as the CEO of a company, uh, his boss was way too busy to have time for me. <laughs> the CEO of a larger company than his at the time. And I was so, I'll never think about that guy the same way again. I mean, it's probably just an overzealous assistant just doing his job, but it was offensive, you know, and you can't delegate nuance, right? Sometimes you got to have a conversation between each other, <laughs> you know, like Todd's saying, Todd emails me, he gets me. Uh, that was going too far. And it, unfortunately left a stain on the way I think about that person and always will. So you have to be careful about that. Yeah. Yeah. I can think of somebody right now that I've lost communication with. And recently we just reconnected and he was shocked at how the communication ended. He had no idea that he had literally blocked communication to where I just wasn't going to deal with it. I, my time's valuable too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, so it, you just get a point where it's like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. All righty. Well, that concludes this week's edition of Headlines. And that means that it is time for this week's main topic. So Todd Tresseter has built his successful two-stage career by walking the walk. First, he became a self-made millionaire by learning how wealth is really created and spotting the contradictions in what is often taught. Then he helped others do the same at Financial Mentor by creating frameworks and guides that help people ignore the noise and focus their financial decision-making and what will actually help them build wealth. And along the way, he's proven to be a believer in a concept that Brian discussed most recently in the first lesson of Community Commerce Essentials. It's two of the seven questions that Brian outlined for finding your winning difference. Who does your audience want to become and who do you want your audience to become. And that latter part is what really has set Todd apart because he wants his financial mentees to view their path to financial freedom as a path toward personal growth as well. In fact, he views them as one and the same. And we're obviously very excited to talk to Todd about all of this today. And so, Brian, I will turn it over to you. Yeah, Todd, um, you know, obviously, because you're in the financial realm, this requires, you know, a, a significant amount of why should I listen to you type stuff? So I, I guess we should run through the background uh, uh, of your role as an evil head. And <laughs> no, um, but just kind of walk us through your background a little bit before we got to financial mentor and, and that phase of your life. Yeah. So when I came out of college, which was obviously a long time ago, judging by my gray hair here, um, I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth and I had dealt with a lot of financial difficulty getting through school, working my way through school. I was in the bicycle capital of the world, UC Davis, and I couldn't even afford a bicycle, had to walk to all my classes. Um, so I was very motivated. I was very sick and tired of being broke. And uh, so I committed to making re wealth a result of my life. I wanted to be financially independent. 
And so I made a study of it and started figuring out. And one of the things I realized is if you want to be financially independent, you have to become a master investor. That that's a criteria. So I went into the hedge fund business. And again, you got to, I'm I'm typically um, pretty far ahead of where things end up. So like when I went in the hedge fund business, there wasn't even such a thing. There was no term as hedge fund. They were all private placement partnerships using the legal, the, the, the legal structures of the failed oil and gas partnerships from the 70s and 80s. Um, so you know, we started in, I was one of the early pioneers of quant investment strategy. It's stuff that MIT PhDs are doing now. Um, but I started, I was hand programming trading systems into the computer. I was using one of the original IBM 8088s, you know, the first PCs with the 8088 processor. They were like a boat anchor. You had a 10 megabyte hard drive and it was considered gargantuan. Um, so anyway, it was early pioneer stuff. I developed these quantitative trading systems, started understanding risk management, started understanding wealth from the math side of it, you know, how you could compound wealth, how the math worked. And the more I learned, the more I realized that it was very different from how it was commonly taught. And so I did build my wealth, uh, as a hedge fund manager, we had a successful fund, I started having problems managing the risk as the market started ballooning in the 2000 top. And so we sold the mark, we sold the business, sold the hedge fund in 1998. And I went into real estate investment. And so then I took the wealth I parlayed in uh, hedge fund investing and had saved from my income in that business and then built a real estate portfolio, which I then sold in. I started selling it about 2005. Again, I started getting worried about a bubble there too. And you can see a theme. I'm always about one to two years too early. Um, so then I started selling the real estate, had it all sold by 2007, was out of the market with everything except my own house. I kept my house. And that was when the decline occurred. And then I got into information marketing and building this business um, around 2008, 2007. Um, and I was late to that. That was one where I was late because the party really began about 2005. Uh, with WordPress. So um, I guess the, I don't, the I don't an, think you were answer, <laughs> the, the answer to your question is I'm one of the few people that's built wealth in all three asset classes, whether right. it's paper assets, real estate, or business. I have built wealth in all three and I teach all three. So it, it's, it's a comprehensive process. It's not most of the people that you find, it's kind of, you've heard that the Indian folktale, the blind men and the elephant, three blind men and the elephant. You know, you send three blind men up to an elephant and you have them uh, define the elephant. One guy will touch the rear rear leg and you'll say an elephant's like a tree trunk. And then the other guy grabs the ear and he says an elephant's like a giant fan. And the third guy grabs the tail and says an elephant's like a rope. That's what you find mostly in financial advice. Everybody owns, you know, they understand one small piece of the elephant, but most people aren't teaching the entire elephant. Right. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, people with your kind of background uh, have positioned themselves uh, very differently uh, as far as, you know, uh, conspicuous uh, consumption and, and displays of wealth. And you're more of a millionaire next door kind of guy. You know, it's more important to accumulate, uh, you know, wealth and assets, not to show off to the neighbors, but, you know, just to provide for the security of, of yourself, your family, and I guess your legacy, right? Uh, yeah. Is that how you've always kind of approached it? It's kind of funny you said that. I ne I never built wealth because I wanted, you know, ostentatious consumption, right? I always wanted freedom. You know, it comes back to where you said, you know, Todd, why are you unemployable, right? My value is freedom. My value is my creativity. My value is my time. Uh, it's not stuff, right? It's experiences, not stuff. And so, you know, I live a nice life. I mean, you know, the house we're in is a very valuable home and it's beautiful, but it's a 1940s home downtown that we completely restored from the ground up. You know, it's not flashy or anything like that, but it fits us perfectly, right? We restored it the way we wanted it. Um, so, yeah, I don't, to me, that's not what life is about. You know, it almost connects back to our earlier conversation on, you know, internet of stuff and and all these things that are going on with cyber, you know, the, all the currencies and all that and and the the change of workforce and all that. You come back to what's your life and what's freedom and what creates happiness and fulfillment, and you've yeah. got to start from that root or that base and decide what is really fulfilling for you and what's going to create the life you want. And then you build some practical business model on top of that, some practical wealth model, have the freedom to be able to create. 
Um, but it's not about the money and it's not about the stuff, but you know, nice stuff and comfort's okay too. I'm not, I'm not a Mr. Frugalist either, but I'm absolutely not wasteful, you know? Yeah. It's interesting also that you emphasize personal growth. Like that's why we're here on this planet, you know, and this is something Mm -hmm. I talk about at further. And then I've been working through this concept of the personal enterprise where a project based approach to entrepreneurism leads to more personal growth than say climbing the corporate ladder, right? It's not necessarily about ambition. It's about pushing yourself to do the next thing. How do you see investing and personal growth uh, complementing one another? If you really think about it, your success outwardly, whether it's money or the success of your business, is just a mirror. It's a reflection of the inward frameworks and base work and foundation and knowledge that you brought to that process. And so... Uh, you know, that's why it's personal growth first. You have to overcome all kinds of obstacles. You have to build that knowledge. I mean, like Brian, you take yourself as an example. You were successful in one business online, and then now you're building a successful another round. You sold off the other businesses, and you evolved it. You went from how you did content marketing in one framework, and now you went into curation as a model. And you're evolving that because you have the core frameworks right You understand how online marketing works and you understand how the marketplace is evolving. And so you're able to pivot, you're able to make those changes. And so it's all that growth and base work you did many years ago that allows that to happen. Well, it's the same thing for me in investing, right? I can go look at crypto, which is a brand new market, brand new, but I can understand how the principles work and how investments work and how all this stuff needs to get applied and where the common narrative around crypto is wrong. And so it's it's the same thing in different fields. And that's why it's always a path to personal growth first. You're not going to succeed if you don't have the basics right and you, you don't have the courage to take the action. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, experience the experience of life, of life is, is the meaning of life. And yet we lose sight of that in our aspirations and accumulation a little bit. Like you said, nothing wrong with and nice things, but... It's not ultimately what, you know, no one's going to say, I wish I worked harder on the deathbed kind of situation. (laughs) You know, it's probably going to be something else. Um, Yeah, well, I'll even take myself as an example. I'm I'm changing my business model and my business plan based on my age, right? At my age, I'm 59 right now, almost 60. And I can feel myself getting older. I'm in great shape. I can do, I can still do most of the activities but I'm definitely getting older. Do I want to spend another few years building out another course? I don't think so. I don't think that's the priority for the next few years with my daughters heading off to college. And so you've got to come from, you know, your growth, your path in life, what's most important to you. And then you make everything else fit around it. One thing that, uh, you know, it's been about a year since we um, first spoke uh, when you were part of Joined Unemployable, and then I looked at your site, and I was just really impressed by the model. And there's two aspects to it, and it's right there in the brand. Um, The use of the term mentor, I know, is an innovation in the way you think of financial uh, education, not in terms of let me do it for you and take a big commission more like, let me educate you and arm you uh, to help you do this for yourself. Right. And the second reason I like the word mentor is anyone creating, you know, anyone doing content marketing, anyone doing, uh, you know, especially information businesses, that's your role. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you've been a 20 year veteran or you're just th- two steps ahead of the crowd People are looking to you for guidance that they're either too busy or they just don't, you know, they're not prepared to have. They need you to take them down that path. Jared alluded to it earlier. What's their version of success? And if you're a really good mentor, then you bring them to a level of success they haven't even contemplated yet. And that's the value add that you're bringing. So, Tell me why you were attracted to this model as opposed to, you know, the more traditional brokerage or financial services model. Well, I mean, the traditional brokerage services model is an investment product sales business, right? So 
not to be rude, there's some really good people that have really good intentions and they're trying their level best to help people within a very conflict ridden profession. Uh, but they're not that different from a used car salesman and you should treat your financial advisor roughly the same. You know, they have investment products to sell and there's a huge conflict of interest in which products get prioritized. I never had any interest in that side of the business. Zero. I never like that's the usual starting point for most people coming out of college. And I went straight to quantitative investment management, which is a field that didn't even exist at the time. It was so new. Um, I just knew I didn't want to be in the investment product sales business. And yet everybody wanted me to hire and everybody wanted to hire me for it. Um, so once I finished on the investment management side, you know, what it was for me was I didn't want my tombstone to read that, gee, Todd was really good at making his rich clients richer, right? Because as a hedge fund manager, all you can take is rich clients, right? Because you have the accredited investor rules. And so I was limited to rich clients that I could manage money for. And we were good at it, right? And we had, what, 12 years with no losses. Um, and that was through a lot of crazy market conditions, um, so we were good at it. We had proven out what we were doing. But then I got to a point, I was like, well, what's the next stage of growth for me? You know, it comes back to what we're talking about here. And my next path of growth, I've I've always been fascinated by wealth building, right? And the investment side of it was only because you had to be good at investing to build and grow wealth in excess of inflation, right? In terms of real purchasing power. And so that was the role of the investment side. But it was not, I mean, it's a fascination because it's an amazing puzzle, Um you know, so it's like this amazing thing to work with, but it wasn't what really drove me. What really drove me was the people. And so I wanted to connect back to people. And that's where like the idea of the course and the community. So the way I launched it was I started with coaching, right? Because I knew I knew how to do it, but I didn't know if I knew how to teach it, right? Which is completely different. And so what I did was I started as a coaching practice and that originally I tried to get financialcoach.com, but it was taken, Right. And so believe it or not, I got financialmentor.com. But again, that's because it was back in 1998. So it was, you know, really early on in getting the .com addresses. So I was fortunate that way. And I started as a boutique coaching business, a service business. And I did the uh, content marketing based on all the stuff that you taught, you know, and worked on the content marketing side of it, built traffic. Eventually, I had a sold out coaching business. And I said, what's next? What's next layer of growth? I'd proven out the model through coaching and that's when I tried to put Todd in a box, right? I'm trying to take my knowledge and productize it, which is where you see the books and the courses. And then that creates the scalable business model. Um, and so that's how you get to the seven figure small. And so that's where I've been going through it. Yeah. And so we talk about, you know, how we're trying to encourage people who do have their various expertise that they've developed, especially people more our age, you know, they have a wealth of knowledge, but one thing they don't know how to do is to build websites and deal with email marketing. And, and, you know, there's more information like, you know, when you and I started in the late nineties, there was nothing. You just had to make it up as you went along and see what worked. Now there's almost too much information and some yeah. of it's of spurious quality, but, um, you know, what do you say to people who may be someone like you, valuable expertise, wants to to take the mentor model in whatever their field is, but they're intimidated by the technology. What do it anyway. Say? Do it anyway. If that's what you want to do with your life, that's your path of growth. Go for it. Um, and it's easier now than it used to be, for sure. I mean, we got off-the-shelf Substack, and, and websites are easier to build than ever. Uh, I was just reflecting on how you know, those of us who did this early, people are like, oh, I wish I would have started back then. Maybe you don't. Maybe you wish you were starting right now because there's probably more acceptance. There's easier technology. Uh, there's more off the shelf situations. You can get a Stripe account, uh, Squarespace and a ConvertKit account and you're in business with your own media company. It's that simple. Yeah. And there's there's so much opportunity. Um you know, I could fill three, three more coaching practices if there was sub coaches that I that I felt confident enough to send people to because I don't take coaching clients anymore. I'm completely on the product side and building out the products. Right. So I stopped taking coaching clients years ago. I dropped a, you know, kind of double six figure. It was over 200,000 a year, six figure business. I just dumped it, you know, to go to the product side. And I mean, it was dumb, right? I easily could have farmed that out to people if there was quality coaches that actually knew their stuff. And I'm sure they're out there. But that's an example of opportunity where people aren't 
aren't doing it. So don't be intimidated. You know, it's not that hard. Yes, there's a learning curve, but that's your path of growth. That's what keeps you young. So just go for it. Yeah. And I do think that the, you know, a lot of people start off as freelancers or consultants, service providers. I really do think that coaching step is, you know, is important. I didn't do it personally. I had plenty of clients in different kinds of businesses and I went straight to education and it worked. But I think that was just because I was kind of fascinated with instructional design uh, the psychology of it and how it related to re- direct marketing. That's not what normal people pay attention to, but that coaching phase, you're dealing with real people and you'll see the same problems over and over and over again. And there you go. You've got basically the outline for a course that's going to hit the right marks. I think people fail with online education when they're just guessing. And yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Brian. Go ahead. No, no. And I I just think that you gained Todd in a box is it came from being Todd with real people (laughs) for a long enough period of time to really grasp what, what the, what the problems are that need to be addressed. Bingo. I mean, you, you said exactly right. What happened was the coaching was always part of a much bigger plan I had, which was to prove out the model. Right. So it's like I knew how to do it, but I didn't know how to teach it. And I didn't know how it worked with other people. Well, I had a huge learning curve ahead of me. I mean, I coached for two decades, two decades of coaching. But here's the thing. It's revenue producing market research. And when I hung up, when I hung up that towel on coaching was when it became too repetitive. When I found myself saying the same stuff over and over and teaching the same things over and over and following the same structures, I realized I had it worked out. Like I had a repeatable system that could be put in a product that would produce the results reliably, but it took me a while to get there. Right. I started with a solid base of knowledge, but everybody brings so much different to the equation. Right. I I mean, people are, we're we're not robots, right. We're bringing so many different resources, skills, hangups, issues, you know? And so like to become really good at the coaching side, it just sets the base. I mean, I get feedback all the time from students in my course. They're stunned, like how I could roll out a beta version of the course. And it's the final version from day one. And it, the reason why is because I've been coaching on this stuff for a long time and I've been mapping it out in a drawer, getting ready for the day to put it in a course. That was always the intention. The coaching was just revenue producing market research. So I could prove everything out and get it into a repeatable system. Yeah, that brings up a fascinating point that I touched on in the past, that the better you're in touch with your audience, your prospects, your customers, your clients, you know, take borrowing language from the lean startup kind of world, uh, the more viable your minimum viable product is. The first time you put it out, it's going to be a lot better than it would be if you weren't taking the time to truly have that kind of empathetic understanding of what's going on. So yeah, absolutely. I think that's great advice for people. Um, you know, if you're on this path, then yes, do it. But, you know, the 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 key is is not the technology so much. That's become easier. The work is really understanding who you're talking to and and what they need from you. Yeah, and just like a big thing for me, Brian, I'm kind of a perfectionist. And so the big thing for me has just been accepting that everything's always halfway broken. You know, like the business is never built. You know, I'm always moving from project to project. And it's just like having to learn to live with that was one of my paths of growth, right? That that it's never going to be all perfect. Yeah, no, that definitely have to, good enough uh, definitely is better than perfect because you're never going to get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're going to blunder into some genius moves. Like in, in the course, what I did was I, I, had the lessons all mapped out in a drawer and had the structure of how I was going to teach it. And there's a start and a finish and how they all tie together and how it escalates the knowledge. Right. Cause I've been coaching people. I knew how it had to work and I knew what the benefit was because I had clients telling me all the time they were going like, I would go back and I would interview. I did a marketing exercise years ago for a marketing class. Right. And it said, you had to go back and interview your old clients that had left you years before And ask them, what was the value proposition? What was the thing that really stood out for you? And client after client told me it was their wealth plan, that they were still working off the wealth plan we had created in the first weeks of their coaching together. 
And, and I, I was like dumbfounded. I had no idea. I was completely clueless because that was just the way I saw it. I had always started coaching clients at the starting point with designing their wealth plan because there was no way to contextualize all the decisions you had to make as part of building your wealth without having that wealth plan formulated. And there's a process you go through to create it properly, right? And so then I come back and I talk to clients who are still working with a wealth plan that they had created with me years and years before, and it was still actionable to that day. And they told me that. And I said, well, there's the course, right? I mean, they told it to me. I didn't have to ask. I mean, I did have to ask, but I didn't have to figure it out. They did the heavy lifting for me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think think what you've just said can be extrapolated to a lot of different businesses where your knowledge is what's going to help guide someone else to get where they want to be. You know, it, you just have to figure out what your wealth plan is in your particular, uh, you know, field of expertise or niche. And, you know, you could do a much worse than actually talking to people as much as possible. (laughs) I think there's another piece in here. Um, You know, you can even look at your career as an example, how what you were teaching or working on is based on your interest. I think that's really important. I've always been a nuthead for wealth strategy and investment strategy. Um, Even once I was financially independent, I was still reading books on it. I couldn't get away from it. It's just my personal nuttiness, if you will. And so and then you can watch like what you got into with further, you know, and and seven figures small and unemployable. These are your passions. Right. And it's where your head is at. Whereas it's probably, I'm going to guess, I don't know, you and I haven't talked about it. I'm guessing your head is not in the content of copy blogger anymore. You're past that. Yeah. You know? I mean, I keep trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I tried, I'll tell you what though, I tried to be into hedge fund investing when I first left the industry, right? And I'll say that's one of the most common mistakes you can make is try to be into the thing you already did. Because that ended up costing me multiple six figures because I had a failed business on the back end of that where I tried to build a hedge fund fund of funds and it just blew up and it's, I didn't give a damn. I really didn't want to be in that business anymore. You know, my passion was where I was heading, which was with this financial mentor business. It was not a hedge fund fund of funds. Yeah. And that's, that's really what I'm saying when a, you know, a purpose driven personal enterprise means, you've got to really listen to yourself about where the next step is uh, because it's so easy to say, well, I should do this. No, not should. What do you want to do? What are you going to throw yourself into with a sense of purpose in serving other people that you can keep going with? Right. Cause it, if it's just about, if it's just about you making some more money, uh, that doesn't always sustain people. It made zero economic sense for me to get in the financial mentoring business and to do a coaching model. I mean, the amount of money I could make as a hedge fund manager, I really question if I'm ever going to catch up. Even if this business goes to seven figures small, I don't think I'll ever catch up for the money I left left on the table through all the years of building this, right? But who I became through the process can never be matched by the miserable cuss of a human I'd be if I'd stayed in the hedge fund business. (laughs) That's right? if I stay, yeah, if I would have stayed an attorney that, oh God, it would have been awful. Hey, yeah. Jared, um, you got yes. any uh, questions for Todd or do you want to let other people ask questions? Yeah, let's, let's, I mean, I do have questions, but we're, we're running up against some time. So let's let some other folks ask some questions and we can, uh, we can move on to that. That was great stuff, guys. That was a really good conversation. Very good conversation. Okay. So. Let's do this. Let's turn on some light jazz, dip into the mailbag, and see if any of our live audience members uh, want to ask a question, or you can hop on with us. If you want to hop on, I will put the link uh, in the chat so you can hop on with us if you want to. But we did have uh, a couple of questions that came in early, and so I want to toss those out here um, to get started. One of them actually uh, has to do with one of the topics that we talked about earlier, and that comes to us from Katie. Uh, who wants to know if we have any thoughts on art investing or selling art and NFTs or selling art as an NFT, and how might that combine with a great email newsletter and content? Well, go ahead, Brian. You go first. No, I, you know, I was thinking um, a week ago, uh, you know, in particular to the art uh, aspect of NFTs, that we have a couple of artists in the community, and I've always kind of struggled with how um, to give advice uh, to that other than, you know, 
it's tempting, I guess, as an artist to perhaps talk about NFT art while therefore priming your audience to buy some from you. That's a bit meta, but you know how I am. Um, but but with art, NFTs make the most sense to me, even though the crypto kitty stuff is just crazy. You know, little memes that are passed around digitally, but one person owns that that little uh, character or whatever. It's it's just kind of bizarre, but I think we also have to embrace that we're headed into a different type of world with when, what a lot of what we place value on right now is ridiculous, it, but we're just used to it, right? You know, like Todd rejects, uh, you know, the, the flashy car and, and the ostentatious house, but a lot of people think that's what it's all about, right? Um, so I think we may be having a shift in some values about what's important. There have always been people who collected things from baseball cards. Um, I have original art in my house, but I kind of appreciate the physical art <laughs> as opposed to owning digital rights to it. Um, so I, it's just something to keep paying attention to because yes, people are buying art uh, NFTs right now. And they have been, and millions and millions of dollars have changed hands. Does that mean that every artist should get into NFTs? I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly feel like uh, it's 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 really a niche thing among people in the crypto world. That is just from what I've seen uh, over the last couple of weeks, really diving into it. That it's almost like it's its own ecosystem. But the rest of the world is hearing about it and going, how do we get in on this? The reality is you're not in the club right now, but will the NFT club expand is what we have to see. That's what you need to watch for. Yeah. One of the things I teach, Jared, is um, there's two different approaches, right? You can do, there's an approach where in 999 out of a thousand lifetimes, you're going to be successful. And then there's the approach where maybe one out of a thousand, you'll get lucky and you'll get successful. And so right now, if you think you're going to hit it big with NFTs on art, digital art, then you're shooting for that one out of a thousand. And maybe you'll get it. Maybe not. I'm not here to take away dreams. But if you read that article, he makes a really interesting point where he points out that success in the digital art world is not all that different from success in the physical art world. The foundation principles are the same, which is you have to develop a gathering which creates a demand for your art and creates right. a shortage of supply and makes you a hot product. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to bypass a great email newsletter and content as the question states. If you want to succeed 999 out of a thousand lifetimes, the, the principles are the same. You know, so what you have one medium in exchanges, which is digital and the other medium in physical. The principles are the same. Yep. I mean, starting a newsletter that highlights... Uh, digital art, if you are a digital artist, could definitely work because uh, I'm reminded of Ryan Holiday's newsletter before he became quote unquote Ryan Holiday, before the obstacle is the way, before ego is the enemy, before stillness is the key, right? He was just Ryan Holiday and uh, he starts uh, a reading list. You know, his big thing was read, read, read all the time. And then he starts an email newsletter saying, here's what I'm reading, sends it out once a month for years before he ever writes a book. Well, guess where he initially launches all his books, you know, for pre-order, right? He developed fans of books as his fans. So there is precedence here. It's not outlandish to think that highlighting uh, the the work of other artists could make you succeed as an artist as well. It's something to think about. Um, but again, we're in uncharted areas, so you do have to create demand. Todd is right. That's the X factor. How do you create demand for this uh, class of art that includes your art? Yep. All right. And the next question that we got is from William. William asks, what are the top resources to become a killer and a poet? <laughs> Brian. Well, you know, poet basically means that you're a creative person that AI and automation is not going to just replace uh, because you are a radiologist who looks at the same scans over and over. Um, a lot of attorneys and 
and accountants and big firms will be completely irrelevant uh, this decade with blockchain and AI. Um, so a lot of the the roles that we think uh, as prestigious, uh, and this goes all the way back to Dan Pink's whole new mind, where he he said the right brain creative people will eventually rule, even though right now it's the spreadsheet set that rules, right? Well, an AI can read a spreadsheet better than me, uh, but so far GPT-3 can't write better than me, and that's what I'm banking on. Um, the killer aspect is really, you know, leveraging uh, strategy, for example. Our seven-figure small uh, intensive course is really a strategic framework for understanding your audience uh, in a way that leads to the kind of success Again, that Todd has had, that I've had, um, by understanding who you're talking to and, and how to mentor them through their problems. So strategy is a big thing. Advanced use of technology. Um, you know, like being a, a, a copywriter who also understands how to run Facebook ads is a nice hybrid marketing skill. But a lot of writers are like, well, I don't do that. I just write. I don't think that luxury of being a pure poet is something we're going to be able to continue with. But I do think it's the poets that have the foundational skills. Um, so if you're, if you're just a, you know, uh, someone with a killer sense for business, you might do fine or you might not. If you don't have the creativity, the empathy, the communication skills, all the so-called soft skills that, you know, the, the uh, spreadsheet people used to make fun of, I don't think they're going to be making fun of us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else to add on that, Todd? I don't mean to add. I thought he said it well. I, uh, Todd, I, looking on your website, financialmentor.com, and I noticed that the tagline up there is financial freedom for smart people, which is a nice homage to the original Coffee Blogger podcast, <laughs> Internet Marketing for Smart People. You see my influence, yes. don't you? Yes. But that leads me to the question I wanted to ask you, which is your podcast. And I noticed you've got, you're about 25 episodes in. When did you start that? And how is that kind of working for you? And where does it fit into your mix? Uh, that's a whole story in itself. So I started that long, long ago. Yeah. Um, and it it has always ranked surprisingly well, and I learned a lot through doing it. So first of all, I used it completely differently in my business than is traditionally taught. So most people talk about making a killer business out of your podcast, right? As if that's the medium. What I realized early on is that podcast is a conversion medium. From the first day, I, I did my first podcast back when I was still a coaching business, and I couldn't believe it. The day, the day I put out that first podcast, all of a sudden my phone was ringing off the hook. This figuratively, right? Because it was all done by email. But you get the point. I yeah. went from could use a few more clients to I had a waiting list as soon as I put that podcast out. And what I got the feedback on was once they could hear me talk, because I sound like some California surfer dude, right? But I write this super academic uh, financial material and advanced wealth building material. And they're like, well, I could relate to this guy. I thought he was unrelatable. I would like to work with this guy, you know, because he's got the knowledge, but he seems relatable. And so what I realized was the podcast used in my business was a conversion medium. So then what I did was I changed the whole strategy. I need to get back to it, but I changed it as I don't want tons and tons of episodes. I don't want to produce one every week. What I want is just really high quality stuff that addresses advanced knowledge. It matches my brand message. So that when they come there, somebody looks at it and they go 25 episodes, that's accessible. Like I can work through 25 episodes. 250 episodes, you have no idea where you're going to start and where you're going to end, right? Well, yeah. 25, it's a small body of work. You can get through it, and then you get a certain amount of message. And so I do want to get back to it because my core business model and messaging has changed since I stopped doing the podcast. But to this day, so as an example, Jared, you know the numbers better than I do. I've got like, 20, what, 25 episodes, and I've got 1.2 million downloads. Wow. So I think that puts me somewhere in the top, what, like fraction of 1% for podcasters. That's And yeah. I haven't published. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, really, really good. Yeah, you know the numbers better than me. But see, there's two different ways you can drive traffic on it. You can either have a high traffic site, which I have, which then drives traffic to your podcast and works as a conversion tool. Or you can try to get your traffic through your podcast, in which case you need a slightly different business model. So you have to look at like the different tools in content marketing and how you connect them so that they all fit together. 
like you also notice, I have no YouTube presence. Another stupid mistake. But I, as I said earlier, the business is perpetually broken. I can only do so much, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to finish the products. I told Brian this in an email and conversation we had. My goal this year is to finish the product line. So I have a product line built out. Then I can go back. I've got a whole different way I'm going to approach the content. Not wholly different, but I'm going to build on the success of the prior uh, written content marketing to really dominate retirement planning. And I've got a model to do that while I build out retirement planning books, which will dominate retirement planning at Amazon as well. And so the books in themselves become a business model. It's all built through content marketing with that. And then I've got to come back and I've got to build more yeah. podcast episodes. And somewhere in there, I hope to build a YouTube channel. I think it's going to be by exerting pieces of content that I produce through the written form. Yeah. But I don't really have that piece worked out. So anyway, that was a long-winded answer. The podcast is really a fascinating story because it highlights so many intricacies of building this business in all the different ways you can go. No, it's a, I mean, it's a smart way to do it when you have evergreen content like what you have. You can really do it that way. What is, you know, a lot of people use a podcast and we kind of use a seven figure small podcast as a weekly touch point, you know, with the audience, stay top of mind, you know, bring them content every week. What do you use as kind of your regular touch point with the audience? Well, I have Brian to thank for that, which is the curation email. That yeah. thing is genius. Okay, and I'll explain why it's genius for somebody with a course business. And I stumbled into this by learning from you, which was that when you're excerpt, when you have a course, which is about wealth strategy and wealth planning, right? That's a big body of work, right? So now what I can do is I can find everybody else's writing that's decent, that touches some little tiny piece of what I teach. And then I get to show my expertise by explaining how that fits into the entire puzzle of wealth building. In other words, like when you read this, notice that they got this piece right, but notice that they're missing this, this, and this. And that's part of what we include in the course. Well, now I've promoted the course without even being promotional. I'm just explaining how you fit this little chunk of knowledge that's in that article into the bigger puzzle of what I sell as the benefit, which is how you become financially independent. And so it's the perfect thing to demonstrate your expertise and to upsell your products without ever being salesy. Yep, yep he gets it. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> so many people don't understand how persuasive curation can be, but he just explained it maybe better than I did. <laughs> um, because you're pointing outside of you, not, not me, me, me. You're like, look at this. This is good. But what about this, this, and this? Oh, here's my course, right? So yeah. yeah. Um, as far as doing a podcast every week, even when Jared and I want to do a podcast every week, we can't for some reason. <laughs> we had some extenuating <laughs> circumstances this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you know, children being born and whatnot. But um, no. No, but the interesting thing that I was thinking of when you said that was, Jared, do you remember when Robert and I produced that eight episode podcast thing to launch the Rainmaker platform? That's what I was going to get at. Of course. It, it was perfectly designed, laser focused. Um, it brings in, you know, the, the relatability and the power of, of hearing your voice with education and traditional content marketing. And it wasn't meant to last forever. It was a Netflix. It, it was WandaVision except eight episodes instead of nine, <laughs> you know, and uh, I ought to do more stuff like that. I think Todd's on to something there. I like doing the weekly show though, because it really does. Like you said, because we have a community that's tied to the podcast and the site. Um, it's a way for, to, to speak both inside the community and out to people outside who may want to join us. So uh yeah, different things, but uh, the Jay Akunzo interview I did uh, a few weeks ago, you know, podcasting is a different medium, and and I'm not surprised at all, Todd, that when people hear you, they're like, oh, this is a real human who also knows all this stuff that he's been sharing with me in text, but now I like him, right? <laughs> well, yeah. and on the fly in an interview, it allows you to demonstrate your expertise, right? Because like, there's a lot of nuance to building wealth. People talk about like it's just some financial science. Yeah, there's financial science behind it, which you have to know. And there's math science behind it that you have to know. But that's like a foundation or a starting point. You also have to know how to integrate it with humans. It's both art and science. And that's where you really break it out. And so when you start going back and forth with these subject matter expertise, with the different people that you have on that have very narrow subject matter expertise, 
it's just it's the perfect demonstration platform without even trying to demonstrate yeah okay, so but i do i do want to throw out i have on my to-do list to try to recreate for my business what you guys did with that eight episode series when you launched um rainmaker platform. oh god it was yeah, Rainmaker. I, yeah. yeah, 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 Rainmaker. I remember that because I was that was really compelling work. I thought that was re- and you guys did something similar for Seven Figures Small, mm-hmm. which I thought was very well done. And so what I did was, again, this is an example of having everything halfway broken. Right? I don't have the time to go create that right now because I'm trying to finish the damn course. Extra- <laughs> sorry, darn course. That's and, all right. so, That's all right. and so what I what I did was I created the sneak peek. Right? I'm, I don't have time to go create this perfect audio series so i created a sneak peek which is exerting five videos from the course and then telling a story through the email that that contextualizes the five videos to create a story about the course and that converts that's thousand dollar sale and that's converting at about five percent for a thousand dollar sale which those pretty numbers good. are pretty strong pretty good excellent All right. Well, gentlemen, let's wrap up. Uh, Todd, financialmentor.com is the site, as you mentioned. What are the other best places for folks to stay up to date with you and your work? That's it. That's the hub of everything. I drag social media around with me like a ball and chain. You know, I mean, I put up with it. (laughs) It's it's in the business, right? Because you have to be present. Um, But I don't really, it's not me. Um, If you want me, it's on the site. Every word on that site was written by me. Everything was put together by me. That's the central hub. I give away a free ebook for new subscribers. I have the largest collection of financial calculators because I said wealth is math, but math is difficult for some people. So I have calculators that do it all for you. So I have the largest collection of free financial calculators uh, on the internet, except for the guys that sell them. Um, And thousands of printed pages of content. It's all free. Subscribe, get a free book. And there's a course if you want to take the next level. There we go. Todd, thanks so much for joining us. There's a lot of insight here that I think can, like I said, be extrapolated into whatever specialization or niche you want to tackle. Um, you know, being of service and guiding people to their version of success. It's it's a tried and true formula. It works time and time again. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great talking with you guys. Absolutely. Okay. And with that, we thank you for listening. May your profits be big while your headaches stay small. And as Brian always says, keep going. Also, go outside. (laughs) Jared. (laughs) It fits. Him, Him and his little sound bites.